Okay, so let's begin. What I want to do now is part two of the Hebrew language lecture. A quick review of some of the ideas that we need is that we understand that we're a nation of a language. We're an Am Kodosh, Hashem chose us, He chose us of all the other nations, and He chose us from all the other languages. Tabachatano mikol amim, v'kol the shonot, in all the languages. Meaning, Hashem gave us, as part of our treasure, He gave us a system through which we can understand the world in, with scientific you know, specificness. That's what we say, if there's any other language like the Hebrew language, it's the chemical language. Because the chemical language is able to describe reality for you. In the same way, Hebrew defines reality. God created 22 letters, and with those 22 letters, He formed the cosmos, He formed us, He formed the world, He formed all of reality. So when we study the 22 letters, and we understand their meaning and their depth, and we combine them, what are we really doing is we're really studying reality, we're studying life. So the study of the Hebrew language has always been one of the major sources of, of wisdom as Jews. Where do we get the information from? So there's one book, which is a book that preceded the Kabbalah, which was written by Avram Avinu, called Sefer Yitzirah. And in it, it's one of the deepest works that we still have in our possession, and it contains a lot of these concepts. It's very difficult to, to comprehend, but that's where a lot of the wisdom is, from Avraham, Abraham, going back over, over 3,400 years ago. But there are more simpler ways of accessing the wisdom. One is, of course, the name of the letter. The name, the simple name, means something. Number two, the shape of the letter. Number three, the numerical value of the letter. Number four, the first time a letter appears in the Torah, where it starts the root of a word. And I'll explain what that means as we go along a little more. When you combine these four things together, in addition to a, a brighter that Rabbi Akiva brings for us in the Gemara and Shab Shabbos, and he explains even further, when you put it all together, you begin to grasp the depth of a letter, and it's like you get the chemical tool now to start analyzing other words. And the more we do this together, the more you'll begin to appreciate and build it yourself. And it's not as difficult as you think, and you begin to gain your own insight into, into what's happening. So first of all, you know, just, just a quick idea. You know, we mentioned that the closest language to Hebrew is the chemical language. You know, so let me just give you an example of what that means, even just, you know, for example, if I would write H2O, of course we know that means that two hydrogen molecules and one <clears throat> oxygen molecule. Now, it's interesting, if I were to write the word mayim, which means water, H2O is water, the word in Hebrew is this word right here, mayim, which is just very interesting because I find that fascinating because if you note mayim, it has two mems and one yud. As if to indicate to us that what? There's two of something and one of the other. Just as we know the chemical language tells us there's two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule. Pretty fascinating. You know, and if you look at the word in Hebrew, for example, for snow. Snow. Snow in the Hebrew is shelig. Shelig. Can anybody read that? My, yeah, are you with me? Shelig. Why is that the perfect description of the chemical property of snow? Well, it's also something just very simple. Numerically, shin is 300. Numerically, lamed is 30. Numerically, gimel is 3. Now, well, that's interesting. 300, 30, and 3. If you think about it, in the process of the formation of snow, what happens? Water contracts. Correct? Water, which is usually wants, the molecules usually want to expand. When water freezes, there is a contraction. So the word shelig is indicating that contraction. It goes from 300 down to 30 down to 3. As if to describe to us the process of the formation of snow. The contraction of the molecules. 300, 30, 3. You hear how that works? You hear the description of reality? Or, for example, what am I saying okay? Is that all right? Expansion, but there's a contraction also. We've had this discussion. There's a contraction also. Now, if you, I'll give you just this one. This one you can't argue with. The word for pregnancy in Hebrew is herayon. Hey, ray, 
Yod. That means pregnancy. If we do a little numerical, val- numerical analysis of it, <coughs> Hay is 5, Reish is 200, Yud is 10, Vav is 6, and Nun is 50. We add it all together, we get, what do we get? 271, which is a very interesting number because 271 days is the exact amount of days in pregnancy. Right? Nine months is 30, and the day itself of delivery is 271. Yeah, you with me? <laughs> so, you hear the specificity of the Hebrew language in describing reality. It's, it's, it's remarkable. It's, it's remarkable. It just, it, it's... But let's take it, let's go a little bit deeper now. But, you know, we could go many angles to it. There are many approaches to it. And I'm going to give you a, you know, a smattering. And hopefully at the end we'll see some system in it. Let's just review something very important. We begin with the Aleph and a little bit of review, but I'll, we have our Aleph over here, as we've seen. <clears throat> Aleph. So Aleph, whenever we see an Aleph in any word, we've discussed this many times, Aleph always represents the connection of something spiritual to the physical. And it makes sense, because Aleph, let's go through our system of analysis. Numerically, Aleph is one. Is one. First time we see Aleph in the Torah is... Bereshit bara elo kim, right, which means God. Good. We take a look at the letters themselves, and the letters are composed of other letters. Aleph is actually composed of a vav and two yuds. Numerically, vav is six, yud is ten. We add that together, that's 26, which is an interesting number because that, of course, is the same number of yud hey, vav hey, which is another name for God, right? Yud hey, vav hey, adoshem. Which is 26, right? Two 12s, right? 10, 20, it's a yud. 10, 20, and 5, five is 26. So again, we have our 26. And then we go a little deeper into it, and we notice that it's actually describing reality. God is the source of all reality. God is the makom, right? The world, God is the place of the world, right? And we look over here, so the deeper literature tells us that the yud represents the ten svirot of the upper world, coming down, connecting, the vav is the letter of connection, it actually means and in Hebrew, connecting to this world with another vav, another yud, sending those ten emanations back. God gives, connects the upper world down to the lower world, the lower world up to the upper world. All the connection which God does right there in the Aleph. And then, of course, we take it a little deeper, and we're stuck by something, a little bit of a problem. You know, Aleph, when we spill out the letters, Aleph, right? Sorry. Aleph. We spell it out like that. Another source for the fact that we see God's oneness in it, we do a little gematria of the letters spelled out. Aleph is 1. Lamed is 30. Pei is 80. 80. We add it together. 80 plus 30 plus 1 is 111. Back to the 1s, you hear? 1, 1, 1, right? Everything is bringing us back to our oneness. God, God is the one. Shem Echad. Now, it's interesting also that Aleph means one, but Aleph, if you vowed a little differently, Aleph also means 1,000. In fact, when we talk about multiplicity, the way the Hebrew language works, Aleph is one, Alephim are thousands. Aleph, Alephim are many thousands. The same word that means one is also the word the Hebrew language uses to mean many of thousands. So, again, that's the question we always have to ask. God, you have an infinite imagination. Why couldn't you have created two words? One word that means one and one word that means thousands. Why, what is God trying to communicate to us by using the same word, which means the same letter that means one, and the same letter means thousands? What's the connection? Well, the connection is, is that Hashem wants us to look at the thousands of powers in this world. There's the power of the sun. There's the power of the wind. There's the power of gravity. There's the power of rain. Right? There's there's the power of fertilization. There's many powers that are acting in this world. But don't look at them as isolated events. See how they're all unified by one unifying source. God. 
You know, the mistake that the idol worshippers would make in life is they would look at the sun, they would look at the moon, they would see the power manifested by those vehicles, and they are, are powerful. In fact, God uses these things to bring blessing to the world. That's what we call in Hebrew mazal. Mazal. But you have to see that behind all the mazal, I should say that actually, God is actually flowing to the rest of the world. Let me show you what that means. If Aleph means one, right? Aleph, it means one, and it means 1,000. Why? Because in the thousands of multiple forces, there's one unifying force. Now, the earlier idolaters, what the, the mistake they made is that God created the planetary system. In Hebrew, we call them mazalot, the word mazal. This word here, mazal. Excuse me, mazal. Mazal. Right? What do we say when you're at a wedding? What do you say to the bride and groom? Mazal tov. When you go to a Brit Milah, what do you say? Mazal tov, right? When somebody gets married, gets engaged, what do you say? Mazal tov. How do you translate that into English? Good luck. Say good luck, right? So I'll tell you, to say good luck to somebody is the greatest insult you can give them. <laughs> it's insulting even to an idol worshiper. Even idol worshippers don't believe in luck. You know, a person gets married, you know, under the good luck. <laughs> You have a one in two chance of making it for the next 40 years. There's over a 50% divorce rate. Good luck. Right? What an insult. What an insult. That's not what mazal means. Mazal comes from the Hebrew word nozel. Nozel. Nozel in Hebrew means... Whoa. Thank you. You got that one too? Yeah. Good catch. <laughs> so you can come on a ski trip, you're coordinated, I see. Okay. That was a test. Okay. Am I good here? Good. Oh, okay. Let's see. Yeah, is that one? Is that one? It's dirty? I think. Yeah, there's only one is. What's going on? Maybe. Oh, wait. I can put that low. Yeah, okay. Okay, technical support, guys. Okay. That's good. Is that good? Thanks, Tom. Oh, good. Okay, good. Oh, they turned like that. Okay. Uh-huh. Just not too tight. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. So the word mazal, Rabotai, comes from the Hebrew word nozel. Nozel in Hebrew means flow. God created the planets and the sun and the moon and everything like that and the stars. He uses them to flow energy down to the world. The mistake idol worshippers made was they looked at those stars and they saw the flow, so they started worshipping the flow instead of realizing that God is behind the flow. So idol worshippers in the past were not crazy. If somebody bows down to a rock or a stone, that person is not an idol worshipper. That, per- that person is, is clinically insane. Right? That person belongs in Creedmoor. When the early idol worshippers worshipped idols, they were not insane. What they were capable of seeing was yes. There is a flow emanating from Mars. There's a flow emanating from Saturn. Right? There's a flow emanating when Jupiter is aligned with Mars. They understood this, and they saw when it's aligned that way, yeah, the crops grow. They were in tune to it. But instead of realizing that God is the source of it all, He's the one unifying power behind the thousand of multiplicities, they started worshipping the individual forces. See how it works? So God creates the letter Aleph. It means one, and it means a thousand. So we should not make that mistake. Never make that mistake to think that the forces are independent of are independent of God. Okay, so Aleph, as we understand it, always represents the most spiritual force in the universe. And whenever we see an Aleph in any word, we understand it's going to represent something about God, something about Hashem. Now, if Aleph represents the highest point of spirituality, what do you, letter do you think represents the lowest point of spirituality? Well, it would be the letter which is the furthest from the Aleph. 
What's the letter furthest from the Aleph in the Hebrew alphabet? The Tuf. That's interesting, the Tuf. And in fact, the first time we see the Tuf in the Torah is in a word that says, Tohu. Tohu. The world was Tohu Uvo'u, which means empty, empty, empty. The physical world by itself, physicality, without God in it, without a spiritual push, without a spiritual underpinning, is empty. It's empty. Perhaps that's why most marriages do fail. It's because a person goes into marriage without saying the purpose of this marriage is to bring God and to bring us closer to something spiritual. It's a physical relationship. A physical relationship without God is empty. Now it's interesting. Look at this. The word in Hebrew for letter is this word. Ot. Ot. Everybody see that? An ot in Hebrew is a letter. If I want to say the letter Aleph, ot Aleph, ot Bet. Interesting. Look how perfectly that, those three letters describe what the Hebrew letter is. What's the Hebrew letter? It's something spiritual which God has linked to form something physical. God created the letters, and with those letters, he joined them to create a physical reality. And the letter Vav, as we know, letter Vav is the, means a hook. It looks like a hook. It means a Vav, the first time you see in the Torah, is Vav HaMishkan, the hooks of the curtains in the Mishkan. It looks like a hook, and even in the Hebrew language, what does it mean? It means and. You connect something with it. So what's an ot, a letter? It's something spiritual connected to something physical. It's also a sign. When God says, I'm going to make a sign with the Jewish people, ot b'nei b'ni b'necho, a sign between me and you, ot. What's a sign? God says, I want you to do something physical which connects you up to something spiritual, like Shabbos. It's a sign of our relationship. Our men, brit milah. Do something physical that connects you, hooks you to... Something spiritual. Yeah. I still understand how does Ted represent something physical? Ted, if Aleph represents the point of God, something, the, the spiritual manifestation in, in the world, the letter which is furthest from it would represent the lowest point of physicality, which would be the tough. I was just wondering that the way we isolated that Aleph is something spiritual. Right. So actually getting the letters, the parts of the letter. Yeah, so, so right. So we could do it with the tough also. Okay. Um, but for just for this discussion, let's just take it in, in, in this way that it's the furthest point from the Aleph. Okay. It's the furthest point from the Aleph. Numerically, it happens to be 400. I'm just going to show you why that's going to be important in a moment. But let's just think of that for a moment. But see how things work so beautifully. I did another example with you last week, but I think it's worth mentioning. We have a... yeah. So in this um, interpretation of how it would be, are you saying that Bet, since it's the second to it, that if the first and the first word in the Torah, Bereshi, it's something spiritual-like? Yeah. It could be. Yeah, well, I'll show you in a second. You'll just see that. Let's take a look at another word. It's a very good point. Let's take a word at this word. This is a word for truth. Look at the word for truth. What's the word for truth? Emet. Right, the name of our organization. Emet. Like my calligraphy. Am I doing a job there? Okay. Emet. Truth. Let's take a look at why these three letters are the perfect description of truth. Okay. First of all, Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Tuf is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, 22. Mem happens to be the exact middle of the Hebrew alphabet. That's interesting. The exact middle point. What is truth? First of all, truth is when you can see the beginning, the middle, and the end. Right? If you're going to look and just see a part of something, is that truth? If you're going to see the end, is that truth? You see the middle, is that truth? No. Truth means you see the beginning, the middle, and the end. Which is what God says to Eov. When Eov is going through all of his pain and all of his, his, his you know, tribulation, so finally God turns to him and says, Listen, Eov, if you really want to understand why you have to go through this pain, you have to have seen it all from the beginning. We have to go back to the beginning of creation and show you the whole movie through. But the truth can be only understood when you see the beginning, 
the middle, and how it's going to play out. Sometimes in our lives, we have pain and we have difficulties, and we say, God, why are you doing it to me? The answer is, when we see the end, we'll understand exactly what was happening in the middle. But because our perspective is so limited, we can't say that we have the truth. We have to trust, and we have to know the truth and the goodness is coming. Truth means you can see beginning, middle, and end, which is a very interesting description of it. Now, it's interesting, our rabbis tell us, if there are three things that we know about life, number one, that we're born from a mother, number two, we're going to die, and number three, that we're going to have to give an accounting before God. Those are the three truths of life. It's interesting, those three truths are right here. If you divide the first two letters, it spells aim, which means mother. We're all born from a mother. If we divide it this way, it spells mate, which means death. And of course, the word together, emet, is one of the descriptions of God. Who Elohim emet. He is a God of truth. Now, interestingly, if we take a numerical analysis, Aleph is one. Mem is 40. Tough is 400. 444. 441. We do what's called a gematria katan. We add them across. 4 plus 4 is 8, plus 1 is, is 9. Why is 9 a very unique number? In, it's 9 is an interesting number because 9 is the only number when you multiply it by any other number, it will always go back to 9. 9 times 1 is 9, 9 times 2 is 27, 7 times 2 is 9, 9 times 3 is, 9 times 2 is 18, what we'll say is 9, 9 times 3 is 27, 2 plus 7 is 9, 9 times 4 is 36, 3 plus 6 is 9, thank you. 9 times 5 is 45, 4 plus 5 is 9, 9 times 6 is 54, 5 plus 4 is 9, 9 times 7 is 63, this is 9, 9 times 8 is 72, am I right? Yeah, yeah, 7 plus 2 is 9, 9 times 9 is 81, 81 is 9, 9 times 10 is 90, 9 plus 0 is 9, 9 times 11 is 99. 9 plus 9 is 18, 1 plus 8 is 9. You can multiply 9 by any combination of numbers that exist. Try it if you want your calculators, do it later. Trust me on it, it will come back to 9. Now, what does 9 have to do with truth? Well, it's interesting, if something is true, you can't hide it. If something is true, it doesn't matter what form it's in, you will see that this is truth. Truth is there, truth identifies itself, it speaks. It speaks out loud and clear. When a person does something right, when we do something right in this world, we don't have to tell anybody. It will speak out, believe me. The truth speaks. Goodness speaks. Doing something which is truthful, which is serving God, which is right, which is correct. You don't have to brag. You don't have to tell anybody. It will be seen. It will be known. Truth speaks. Truth will be visible. And it's always visible. And that's why in every generation, you know, you've had systems that have tried to corrupt humanity and society and people. It always falls in the end because truth comes through. Truth will always break itself through. It will always be noticed. Now, it's interesting. If you notice these letters of Emmet, they're all letters that have a base. Very solid. Truth is something which can stand. See all the feet there? Everything has two legs to stand on. Let's contrast that with the word for falseness in the Hebrew alphabet, which is Sheker. Sheker. What's interesting about the word for sheker, which is falseness, is notice there's only one leg. You see that? Something is false, it's baseless. It's also interesting, by the way, whereas emmet, truth, is first, middle, and last, the word for falseness happens to be three letters in the Hebrew alphabet which are right next to each other. Kuf, resh, shin in the Hebrew alphabet are right next to each other, but in the wrong order. Kuf, here it's shin kuf resh. Really, it should be kuf resh shin. So sheker is something where you're only seeing one part of the picture. That's falseness. You're seeing a little teeny piece. It's like you look through a, 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 um, a keyhole, and you think you know the whole story. No. You're seeing one isolated event. You look through a keyhole, right, and you see a man with a mask, and you see him, he's holding a knife, and he's ready to stab. What are you about to do? You call 911. You call the police. The police kick down the door. And what do they see? It's a dentist. It's a dentist. You know, you hear a scream, and you hear the drill, and you hear the yell, and he has a knife. He's, you know, he's helping him. But you thought he was killing him because you're looking through a keel. That's falseness. When you see one part of the story, that's Shekhar. 
Truth means you have to see the entire vision. You have to see what's going on. Now, it's interesting. The truth of life is when you can take God and you can transport God all the way into everything you do in the physical world. Aleph is God, represents the highest point of spirituality. Tuf represents the lowest point of spirituality in the physical world. Mem is my favorite letter. Not just because my name is Mordechai. And my wife's name is Monica. Mem is my favorite letter because Mem happens to be numerically 40. And it means Mayim. It means water. What is water? What's the property of water? Water always wants to be in motion. It always wants to move. Right? Water doesn't like to, in fact, you know, you spill a cup of water, it doesn't, the molecules don't like to come together and join together. They want to expand out. Rivers want to flow. Right? Water wants to move. It's always in motion. Definition of water, it's in something moving, in motion. Now, it's interesting. Forty men happens to be the middle point of the Hebrew language. The mem is the middle point. Now, look at mem. Mem, numerically, is forty. Now, what's interesting about that is... In Judaism, is 40 an important number for us? Well, let's think for a second. How many years in the desert? 40, right? The Midbar. The Midbar was 40 years. Let's think. How many days at Har Sinai, the mountain of Sinai, when we receive the Torah? 40. Matan Torah. Right? Matan Torah. The beginning of the Torah. 40. Let's keep going. How many days of rain were there when God destroyed the world? Mabul. In the Mabul, there are how many days of rain? 40. Mabul. That's interesting. 40. If you have a mikvah, in order for a mikvah to be kosher, you know a mikvah is a, it's a gathering of water that has to be rain water, it has to be gathered in a cistern that's into the ground. And it has to be purely rainwater. A 40, it has to be 40 saw. 40 saw is approximately the weight of a human being. 40 saw for it to be kosher. So a mikvah, which again is the mem, has to be 40 saw, it's called. Now it's interesting also, we know from the Gemara Brachot that after a certain number of days, you should stop davening for a boy because the sex has already been determined. How many days does it take till the sex has been determined? It's actually a medical fact as well. 40 days. 40 days. The point of gestation, where there's, you go from cellular life to actual human life, is 40 days. We call it me imo. Me, me imo. The womb of the mother, stomach of the mother. 40 days of gestation. Now it's interesting. Why all these 40s? 40, 40, 40, 40. 40. The, the Midbar with desert was 40. 40 days of heart, Mount and Torah was 40. 40 days of the flood. 40 days of uh, 40 saw the mikvah. 40 days in, of gestation in, in the womb to go from cellular life to, to human life. And notice that they all begin with a mem. Very interesting. All begin with a mem and they're all 40. So what is happening? What's special about all What's the common denominator of all of these events? Cosmic is transformation. In order to go from a slave nation to a free nation, we need 40 years. In order to go from a nation before Torah to a nation, a holy nation of Torah, we need 40 days. In order to go from a world which is so corrupt and needs destruction to a world which now merits to exist again, you need 40 days of cleansing. In order for a woman to go from a state of impurity to purity, she needs 40 saw. In order for a baby to transform from sailor life to Let's say human life, it requires 40 days. Mem, the number 40 for us, always represents the idea of change, of transformation, of expressing something out, of bringing something out anew. Now that's interesting because if you look at certain words, we look at emet, one of the truth of life, which is really the job of the Jewish people, is we have to take the Aleph, we have to take you, God, the vision that God is everywhere, and we have to transform it, we have to bring God out 
into the physical world and everything that we do. See how that beautiful is? That's the job of a Jew. Express God out in anything, the physical aspects of your life, in your work, in the way you eat, in the way you interact with people, the way you interact with your spouse. Express God out into everything. Bring Him through. Now, it's interesting. Everyone with me? Everyone with me, everybody? The word in Hebrew for the human being is this word. It's Adam. Adam. Okay, there we go. Adam. Why did I write that? What letter am I interested in over here? What letter am I interested in? Let's analyze Adam for a minute. Adam is the human being. So the first thing we notice about a human being is there's an Aleph. Right? That's interesting. The most basic element we have to know about every human being is that we have, we're created in the image of, of God. If you miss that part in another human being, you've missed the human being. If you can't see godliness in another human being, uh, your, our eyes are not trained properly. Our eyes have to notice godliness in another human being. We have to notice in ourselves. The second part, of course, is that we're dam. Dam is blood. Now, we mentioned last week, I believe, or two weeks ago, that dam is the perfect description of the physical part of who we are. Why? Because we know we have 33,000 miles of veins and arteries in the human body. The human body, the veins and arteries in one human body can circle the world twice. 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 Remarkable. That's part of the creation. Shem's Bria. Shem's Bria. Shem's, you know, <laughs> just show you this for a second. The word for, sorry for going out of order. The word for, the word for the creation in Hebrew is Bria. Bria means the creation. Bria. You know what's interesting about this word? Bria. If you change your letters around a little bit, it spells this. Bait. Bhira. Bhira. Bria means the creation. The physical creation is the Bria. Right? If you change the same letters around, it's Bhira, which means for the sake of awe. You say, we use the Yirei Shemayim. First is Yirei Shemayim. They fear God. Yirei doesn't mean fear of God. It means Ri'ya. He sees. He's in awe of what he sees. That's what it means to have Yirei. The person, person who said this person is a Yirei Shemayim. It's not that he's afraid. He might be in awe, and the awe causes him to tremble. Who wouldn't tremble if you're in awe of God? But you hear how it works? If you look at creation correctly, that should bring you to Yirei. Awe of the Creator. The creation contains Yira. Study the creation. Think about it for 10 minutes, that there are 33,000 miles of arteries and veins in my body that could circle the world twice. And it's compact in such a system that uh, we don't even notice. That should bring us to a little bit of awe of the creator, of Yira. See how it works? See how the Hebrew language speaks it out so perfectly? Study creation. But the purpose of studying creation is for the sake, but means for the sake of Yira, of awe of God. Beautiful. So let's go back for a second. Adam. We have the Aleph. The human beings create the image of God. We have the blood, which is the Dam, the physical part of who we are. Dam, of course, we know is the Gematria 44. Yes, which is the Gematria of Av, which means father, and Aim, which means mother. Av means father. Av plus one is three. Aim. Aleph plus Mem is 40. You add them together. No, excuse me, 41. Sorry, excuse my math. 44, right? Beautiful, right? Because we know that there are three parts of creation. God supplies the soul, and mother and father supply the, the physical component. Dam. Now, our rabbis tell us, of course, that if a person thinks they're only physical, and just goes after the physical body, and thinks they're only Dam, Dam happens to be the same root in Hebrew as Nidam, which means dead. Or domem, which means lifeless. If you think you're just physical, you're dead. Or dumb. Or, or dumb. Right, that's right. That's right. That's right. Good. Very good. Very good. The beauty of the human being is the balance between the, the three. Bringing the Aleph out into the physical part of who we are. Now, our rabbis tell us that Adam 
is a very important word because if you change the letters around a little bit, Adam, you switch the letters, it spells Mi'od. Mi'od in Hebrew means means very or more. More. Mi'od, more. The essence of the human being is we're born in potential and we have to become Mi'od. Interesting, that's who we are. An animal, in contrast, is called a behema. A behema, which means ba ma. In it is what it is. An animal doesn't need to change. You never say to a dog, you know, stop eating off the floor. I say to my little son all the time, stop eating off the floor. Right? You know, you know, why? Because we have expectations that our job is to become somebody great. We're born with potential. We have to become the old. Now, it's interesting Adam is the same letters as Adama, because God created us from the Adama, the earth. Question, does earth have any real value of its own? I dare say no. What's the value of the mud under the Chrysler building or under the Empire State building or under 56th and 1st Avenue? Versus the same chemical composition of the mud in some field out in, um, I don't know, Nebraska. Is it the same dirt? I was like, the same dirt, same composition. So why is one you know, square mile worth you know, 100 million and one square mile is worth uh, $100? Location, location, location. I think I'll real estate people here. Location, 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 meaning the potential of what you can do with it determines its value, true? Dirt, Adama, is the perfect description of something which has potential. God created man from the Adama. Why? Because the essence of the human being is we're created with potential. But it's our job to actualize our potential. Now look at the word Adama. Adama, if you vowel it a little differently, it spells this word. Adame. Adame. Hebrew speakers. Adame. What does Adame mean? Adama means dirt. Adame means, you have to know a little bit of Hebrew for it, but I'll tell you, it means I will be domna. I will be comparable. I shall compare myself. Adama means dirt. Adame means in Hebrew, I will compare myself. Who will I compare myself to? I will be dome to the Aleph. Dome in Hebrew means similar. I will be similar to Hashem. That's the potential of a human being. A person can be dirt, but in the same word that means dirt is the exact same letters, it must be the same order, that means I shall compare myself to God. I will be Adame, I will be comparable. Dome, comparable to the Aleph, to God. That's the potential of a human being. What are you going to be? Are you going to be dirt? Or are you going to be godlike? That's our free choice. That's the power of free choice in the human being. And there it is in the word. Adama, Adame. Same word. Ground, and I shall compare myself, or be comparable to God, Doma to the Aleph. Do you hear the, 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 you hear this language? Interesting language. Now, let's take a look at the Adam for a moment. It's interesting that Aleph is written like this. The letter Aleph, of course, we means the highest point of spirituality. How do we pronounce an Aleph, by the way? Listen to my, listen to my Aleph. You hear it? You heard my Aleph? Did anybody hear it? You heard it? No sound. It's silent, right? Because something spiritual doesn't have a sound. The highest point of spirituality it has no physicality. The Aleph has no physicality. It's the highest point of spirituality. All the other letters have sounds. Right? Now, interesting. What's the mission of the human being? A person is born Adam. He's born with an Aleph, and he's born with blood. Physicality, spirituality. The mission of the human being is to become mi'od. Meaning, what does it mean to become mi'od? It means transfer that aleph that you have, that godliness you have, into everything you do out in the physical world. Look at the word mi'od. What did I tell you the letter mem meant? Mem is the letter of mayim, right? Forty, transformation. Transfer out that aleph 
into the Dalit. The Dalit in the Hebrew language always represents the physical world. Why? Well, let's see. First of all, the way it's shaped. It has the four directions. It's the first letter to start expressing itself in four directions. Up, down, right, north, south, east, west. Numerically, it means four, which is the four directions. It means, Dalit means a delit, a door. A door. Why is a door the perfect description of the physical world? What? Why is a door? If I can describe this world, the perfect description of this world is a door. The purpose of this world is a prus door, the Olam Abba. The purpose of this world is a doorway to lead us somewhere else. That's this world. This world is an end in itself. A doorway has to get you somewhere. That's why we make a big deal about doorways in Judaism. What do we, what do we put on every doorway in our house? A mezuzah, which has the most important fundamental, fundamental statement of the Jewish people. Hashem, everything is you. Hashem Echad. Right? Why? Because doorways illustrate to us what this world is. So the word, the word letter that means the physical world happens to be the Dalit, which means Dalit, which means door. So uh, the job of the human being is you're born Adam. You're in potential. Your Aleph is over here. Your job, however, is to become Yod. Transport that Aleph out into the physical world, into everything that you do. Bring the spiritual side of who you are into your life everywhere. That's what it means to become Yod. We hear everybody? Good? Let's take a look at men and women for a moment. There's a word we use for a man which is called Ish. It's a word we use for women called Isha. What letter does a man have that a woman doesn't have? A man has a Yud. No, no, no. Just, just, no, just a hey. What letter does a woman have? She has a hey. Okay, let's do a little analysis here. Ish means man. Isha means woman. Simple analysis is, of course, that... A man has a yud and a woman has a hay. At the point of marriage, a man combines his yud with a woman's hay, and you have God's name. Ka, ya. One of the names of God, of course, we know is, right? Is ka. That's one of the names of God. Marriage is a man bringing something, a part of God, a woman bringing a part of God, and together they can discover God in a way that neither of them could do alone. If a man and woman enter marriage without wanting to bring God into the picture. We don't care about a spiritual life. We don't want to care about Shabbat. We don't care about Kashrut. The goal of our marriage is to vacation in Tahiti all the time or to live in wherever, right? Or to have fancy whatever. If that's the goal of the marriage, let's remove the Yud and the He. What does it spell? Esh, which means fire. You have two fires that consume and burn each other up. And, you know, that there's a 65% divorce rate in the world. Maybe it's due to the fact that instead of bringing out God and bringing a relationship with God that can only come when a man and woman combine, if God isn't part of the equation, there's fire, there's conflagration. There's just two people burning each other up. And who wants to be in that type of environment? Better get out. Better run for your life. So we see something very interesting just in the shape of the letters. Ish, Isha. You bring God in, you get something beautiful. You take God out, you have fire. Now let's take it a little deeper. Yeah. Quick question. Can you, um, can you describe the hay, like what the hay represents? Yeah. yeah good, good question. Hold on a second. That's a very excellent question. Let's go a little deeper on it. First, let's understand why is a yud the male letter? The yud is the male letter. So, the Yud is a very interesting letter because the Yud, as you notice, when you light a Yud, a Yud never touches the top of the line. It never touches the bottom of the line. It just hangs there. 
A yud is actually just a dot. If I'm going to form any letter, I first have to have a point, and then from that point, I can do whatever I want, right? Yud is just a point. That's all it is. The deeper literature tells us that yud represents the idea of thought. It represents the idea of an idea of thought. Numerically, it's 10. 10 is, mathematicians tell us, is a cognitive number, a thought number. Why? Because 0 to 9 have natural symbols. Once you get to 10, you have to start using thought to formulate it, to create it. Do we hear that? 0 through 9 have their own shape. Once you get to 10, you have to start combining other numbers to create it. You have to use thought to create this new system now, beyond 9. It represents the idea of thought now. It's a thought number. It's a, it's a cognitive number. It's also interesting that when you any want to form something in the future, if I want to say something will happen in the future, in the, right, in the third person, what do I say? For example, he will sing. What do I say? Who? Yashir. He will go. Who? Yelech. He will stand. Who? Yakum. Whenever you want to say something will happen, you use the Yud. Yud represents the idea of an idea, of thought. Now, this is the male letter, Yud. Because the job of a man in this world is to be involved in ideas. Those are the careful what I'm going to say. A man's vision in this world, gentlemen, is to take big ideas and pull them down. Bring down the inspiration of godliness into the world. Be connected to Torah, be connected to thought. That's why learning Torah is the key mitzvah for a man. Bring down the ideas. Reach up and bring ideas down. That's the vision of a man. To extend upward make a connection, a root connection, so to speak, with God, and therefore allow God to flow his ideas into the world. That's a man's job. Reach up and to bring down, bring ideas down. Men live in the world of ideas. That's the vision of a man. It's interesting. On that thought, we'll come back to this. I'm not, I'm not leaving it, don't worry. A man has a mitzvah of tefillin, correct? So when a man puts the filling on, right, he's putting a box up here. Big box? Yeah. He's putting a big box up there. And on that big box, there's a shin on this side. There's a shin on this side. And he's putting his head between the shin. What's the word for head in Hebrew? Rosh. Rosh, which is the meaning of the letter resh. Right? The letter resh means rosh, means head. So when a man puts his head, his rosh, in the middle, it actually spells something. It spells shoresh. Shoresh in Hebrew means roots. A man is reaching up. He's making a root connection. He's linking his roots up to the higher world in order that God should bring ideas down. And that's when the tefillin straps extend all the way down a man's body. Right? Right? They extend all the way down a man's body to the loins past the lower part of who he is, right? Make a root connection, connect with God upstairs, allow God sap, so to speak, his ideas to penetrate you and to come all the way through you. Bring ideas down deep. Bring it down. That's the vision of man. That's the vision of a yud. A yud is an idea. That's a yud. That's all a yud is. It's a thought. It just hangs there, like an idea. But you can't live in the world of ideas alone, can you? The world ideas alone are very lonely places. Right? You need to do something with an idea. An idea needs to be brought out into the world. A woman has a letter. Is everybody with me? Mm -hmm. A woman has a hay. Now, 
A He is a very fascinating letter. Because if you look at a He, you'll notice that a He is composed of a Dalit and a Yud. That's the way you write a He in the Torah. It's a Dalit and a Yud. What did we say the Dalit represented? Four. It means Delit, a word, right? A door which represents the idea of the physical world. And what did we say a Yud represents the idea of? Thought. So what, what is a He? A He is the letter that shows a thought, an idea being expressed out into the physical world. Right? That's what a He is. A hey is an idea being expressed out into the physical world. <sighs> By the way, right, if I were to take my Yudah, my Dalit, and I would write them like this, it spells hand. Why is the Yudah and the Dalit the perfect description of a hand? What does a hand do? The job of a hand is to take your ideas and express them out into the world. The hand is the interface of my ideas and the physical reality. True? That's what a hand does. A hand expresses my ideas out into the world. That's a hand. Purpose of a hand. It's also interesting, by the way, num numerically, a yud is 10, dal is 4, which is 14. Why is 14 the perfect description of a hand? 14 right. 14 points of connection. 14 joints. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Right? 14 points in which I make my connection out into the world. Right. So if a man's job is to be a yud, to bring an idea down, a woman's job is to, to take that idea and make it real in the world. Right. Perfect example, of course, is, is reproduction. A man provides the seed. The genetic composition which gets it going, the idea, so to speak. A woman then takes that idea and nurtures it, and nourishes it, and forms it, and shapes it, and after nine months expresses that idea out of the world, the form of a child. Do you hear how it works? A man is the idea. I'll say it anyway. If you look under a microscope, you'll notice that right, a man's seed looks like a yud. And if you look under a microscope, you'll notice that a woman's egg happens to be the shape of a hay. So, right. The physical reality is describing the spiritual system. The spiritual system, the spiritual world is the system. The spiritual and the physical world, of course, intersect. They meet. So a man's vision is to be involved in the world of ideas. A woman's vision is to take those ideas and express them out. So whereby a man might learn the intricacy of the laws of Shabbos and might be involved in the theoretical aspect of Shabbos, a woman's vision will be to take a home and transform that idea in a way that, yeah, there's an environment here that, that lives it. You live it. Right? That's the beauty of marriage. A man could be in big ideas, and a woman could take his big ideas and, like, and make it real. Which is more important? Right? Ideas are life. Right? You need both. You need both. They're both super important. But that's the vision of male and female. Idea versus expressing that idea out into the world. Now it's interesting. God created the world, it says, with the letter He. Torah says, the He Baram, which means He created them, but our rabbis explain that word to mean the He Baram. With a hey, God created the world. Why did God choose to create the world with the letter hey? Why? Because what's the description of the physical world? The description of the physical world is you have a physical reality that contains a spiritual idea within it. There's a spiritual idea within the physical shape of the world, anything in the world. So the hey is the perfect description of the creation of this world. Now, we looked last week at a word for love. And let's take it a little deeper this week. And we said that the word for love is ahov. Right? Ahov. 
love. So why is this the perfect description of love? Right? Simply, we said, well, numerically Aleph is one, numerically Beit is two. And we said, of course, every letter not only has numerical value, it has a meaning. We said that the letter He means give. Right? The letter He means give. We see it the first time the He begins the root of a word. It's in Parshat for Yigash, when the brothers are down in, in, in Egypt. So Yosef wants to give them food. So Yosef says, He lachem ochel, which means give them food. He lachem, give. So it's consistent. But if you look at the letter, hey, why does this letter mean give? What does it mean give? Well, first of all, what? What is a gift? First of all, right. First of all, when you give, the point of giving, of course, is your hand. Right? That's true. And, and, and what, what is a gift, really? A gift is giving something from me to you. It's a giving of... A gift, what's the point of a gift? A gift isn't the physical object, is it? The beauty of a gift is what is behind that gift. Right? When something comes for you, the idea behind it. What did you have in mind? Your intention. When you give something from you, your thought, your, your, your spirit, right? It's coming from your heart. When that gets out into the physical world, it gets out to somebody else. That's what giving is all about. You're giving something the deepest part of you. Your idea of your love, you're expressing something out to the other. One gives to two. One gives to the other. And of course we mentioned that what's the way of really building love when you give to the other in Aleph. You give something spiritual to somebody else. You create a much deeper feeling of love. Why? Because love is going to be a function of, you know, if you can give something of greater value, the love will be greater. The greatest thing of value we give to somebody is we give that person an olive. What is an olive? Either we give them a home in which we bring God down deep. We show that person that there's an olive inside themselves. We make them aware of their greatness, of their talents, of something we have that's special. We give them an olive. We give them a devar Torah. We give them a way to connect up to God deeper. That, of course, generates and builds the love in a much, much deeper way. Fashion. Good. Let's go into the word world of prayer for a moment. We said there was a letter that represents the male. In addition to the yud, there's another male letter. That letter is a Zion. Zion. Now, a Zion in Hebrew, it looks like a sword. It means a sword. It also means zan, which means to nourish. What's the idea of a sword? A sword is something you use with for conflict, right? You use to, to fight. So the job of a man in this world basically is either he has to fight to defend or he has to fight to bring food to the table. It's not always an easy job. Zan. We mentioned that there was a letter for a woman, which was a gimel, another letter, the gimel. Gimel is the Hebrew letter, that's not a good gimel, is that a good gimel? Yeah, okay, decent. Yeah, yeah. okay. Gimel, if we write the gimel out, gimel actually means, gimel means to give. Gomel chasadim. It also happens the same word as gimal, which means to wean a child off milk. Question. Why did God choose the same word, which means to give, gomel, and gimel, which means to stop giving? Gimel means to give, and gimel means to stop giving, to wean a child off milk, to stop milk. Why is the same word in the Holy Tongue? God has an infinite imagination. Why did he choose two different words? So what's the inner core? What's the interconnection between the two? What's the greatest kindness you can do for somebody? When you, get when you can stop giving. When you can create independence. That's the greatest kindness. The greatest giving is to give to a point where the person is full, they don't need you anymore. You can wean them off of you. That's independence. Right? If I'm going to be helping my, let's say, 
five-year-old ride her bicycle, like a two-wheeler. So I'm going to be running after her, trying to hold her up, you know, running down the street. And I'm doing kindness. Now, if I'm going to do that for my 17-year-old, am I doing kindness? No. I'm <laughs> big and overprotective nut, right? <laughs> and, and that's ridiculous. Real giving is you want to give to a point where you create independence. Now, it's interesting. That's why the first time we see the gimbal in the Torah, it's because it's this word, which means gadol. Gadol means big. The whole purpose of giving is to create somebody to be a gadol. Big. They don't need you anymore. In fact, if you break the letters down of gadol, it means you give to a dal. You give to somebody who's poor. Until you become a gadol. Now, it's interesting, by the way, the letter gimel also means gamal. Gamal means a camel. What's the connection between a camel and giving and not giving? What's the connection between a camel? What does a camel have to do with the whole picture? What's unique about a camel? Water. It can contain water and basically go about 30 days, I think, without drinking. It has the capacity to be self-sufficient. What's the greatest kindness you can do for somebody? To create self-sufficiency, independence. Do you hear the consistency? Consistency? So Gimel represents the female letter. Hey, I don't like that. Let's start again. So we have the male letter, which is Zion. We have the female letter, which is the, the Gimel. Now, we mentioned that the letter of connection in Hebrew is a Vav. Right? Because a Vav, first of all, it looks like a hook. It means a hook. Vav is the letter of connection. Vav a mishkan. How do we say a married couple in Hebrew? We say a, right, a zug. Zug. The male is connected, hooked up with the, the female. That's a married couple, right? The male energy hooked it with the female. Now, I know I showed you that last week, but the reason I showed it to you again is because I want to discuss the Zion. The Zion, again, we mentioned, looks like a sword. Right? It means a sword. It's interesting. The letter Chet in Hebrew, the next letter, is this letter right here. That's a Chet. I see right a Chet in the Torah. What letter do you see in the Chet? What do you see? You see two, two Zions. Correct? Two Zions facing each other, as if two people with swords in combat, fighting, yet unified by a canopy. The Chet always represents to us two opposites which become unified. Two things that are potentially in disharmony, finding unity in them. Two things of a fight, but no, we're going to unify it. That's a chet. Two swords facing each other, unified by a canopy. Now it's interesting, the first time we see the, 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 the first time we see the chet in the Torah is by the word choshech. Choshech. Which means darkness. You know why? Because in life, if you can't unify certain ideas, you're going to be in darkness. You know, if, if you're, going to, you're going to look and you know, look, God, I know you're all about love and goodness, but like, why does this happen to happen to me? I, I'm, I'm in darkness. If you can't unify it and look for deeper explanations, it's going to create darkness. You can have opposition, and that's going to create darkness. But other times we use the word chet, it's for chayim. Yeah. Or chet can mean, actually the letter means chiyut. Chet means chiyut. Which means life. If you can unify the opposites in your life, you can find harmony and find God in everything that happens, even the difficult areas of life, right? You're going to have chiyot, you'll have life. That gives you life. So you can either be in darkness or you'll have life. But chet is all about unifying two opposites. Now it's interesting. What's the, le- what's the thing, you know, we had a wedding last week, right? What, the bride and the groom stand under this canopy. What's that canopy called? Chupa. Chupa.
Chupa. Chupa means the wedding canopy. If you break those letters down, you know what it really means? Chet po. What does po mean? Here. The chet is here. Oh, you have a husband, you have a man, you have a woman. You have two beings which potentially can be in opposition to each other. Women have their strengths, men have their strengths, women have their disadvantages, men have their disadvantages, right? Men have their weaknesses, women have their weaknesses. Men, there's a lot of differences. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus, right? We have a lot of differences. Two things that potentially can be in disharmony. What does the chuppah do? It unites it, unifies it. Don't worry. Chet po. The unity is over here. Chet. Yeah, that's what hope is. Bringing two people that could potentially be adversaries, bring them together in a union and in a life where each of our strengths will complement the other and help bring the other to a place we couldn't have gotten alone. The chet is here. Chet is po. The unity between two opposites is present. That's what a chupa is. Got that, Esther? Chet po. That's your chupa. Chet po. Chupa is Yeah. Doesn't chet also mean sin? Chet can also mean sin. When you say like a lot of chet, Right, chet can mean chiyot, it can mean life, it can mean chet. It's a different, little different spelling. But you're right, it can be the aspect of sin. Sin is when you can't unify these two opposites in life. Right, you have your own drives, and your own passions, your own wants and needs, and there's God's word, and I don't want to put it together. There's a fight, there's a conflict. That's chet. That's why, by the word, you know, the word for chet is actually this word over here. If I were to write out the word for chet, which means sin, chet, it's, it's like this. Chet. Right? Chet. Chet. Which letter is silent? Oh, that's interesting. What's the source of all sin? When you choose to silence God. You don't want to listen to God. You know, when we're very aware of God, we don't sin. When we're aware of people, we don't sin. Right? Isn't that true? You know, all of a sudden, you know, you're doing something wrong, somebody walks in the room, oh, oh. <laughs> You know, we sin because we choose not to see that God is watching us. That's a sin, is we silence God. God is present, but we choose not to focus on it. Free choice means that we can focus. And we can see or we can choose not to see. That's chet, that's sin. Silence the God, silence the owl. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Here's the question. Uh, not to ask, like, what's worse, knowing that you're doing something wrong and doing it? Or choosing not to see that you're doing something wrong, you know? Like, choosing not to see. So if you know that you're doing something wrong, God is watching, but you're still going along with it. It's better than that. Uh, yeah, look, know I'm doing something wrong. And if you know you're doing something wrong, you're on, this is on the path towards tshuva. I know I'm doing something wrong. I've got to try to stop. If the person chooses to die, it's okay. When one rationalizes what I'm doing wrong is really right, then the person's in danger. But of course, our rabbis tell us that you do something three times, you rationalize that. Like we say, you do something once, it says, you know, oh, oh my gosh, I, I couldn't believe I did that. Two times, ooh, I feel a little bad. Three times, what I did was a mitzvah. It says, shlo shepamim hutrobo. That's what it says, hutrobo. You made it a mitzvah. It's permitted to you. Right? No, let's go to market. You made it a mitzvah. What if you don't regret it? You don't regret it. Yeah. Third time, you don't regret it anymore. Third time, it's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah. Times oh, it's a mitzvah. You know what? It's a mitzvah. You know, first time you feel bad. Second time, you know, first time you regret it. Second time you feel a little bad. Third time, I'll, I'll tell you exactly why I just did was a mitzvah. It's amazing. It's amazing. You know why? Because, and the reason is, the reason is very, very deep. The reason is because the human being is so holy. The essence of who we are is the soul. And when we do something that, that is wrong, then we silence the olive, so to speak. We, we cause a blemish on the soul. There's such pain that we're experiencing inside ourselves. The only way to deal with that pain is to rationalize what we did is really right. Because we can't live with ourselves to feel that I've done something that's rebelled against God. The soul can't tolerate that. We can't tolerate that, really. The only way to, to live with ourselves is to say, I didn't do anything wrong. I did a mitzvah. I did a mitzvah, but I did was right. I had to scream at him. You know, how would he learn if I didn't scream? Right? It's the only way to teach. It's not for me, it's for him. You know, right? They got to do that, right? I, you can rationalize anything away, you know? 
they can make you buy anything. You know, immorality, whatever it is, you know. It helps the marriage. Oh, yeah. but people can rationalize anything away. Because they can't live with themselves in the feeling that they've 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 rebelled against God. That's the power of rationalization. That's why we have to be very careful. And the core of spiritual growth is really being in touch with our rationalizations. And believe me, we have power to rationalize anything. <laughs> anything. Three times it's a mitzvah. That's what keep in mind. Keep that in mind in everything that we do in life. Okay, let me take you through one more point over here. I want to take you through the most important thing that we say every day as Jews. Twice a day we have a mitzvah to say, Shema. Right, just before I do that, right, let me show you the power of free choice for a second. The power of free choice. What's the word for choice in Hebrew? Right. To choose is bachar. That's interesting. In these three letters contain everything we know to do about free choice. Bachar. I could write these letters as chaver, which means a friend. If I make the correct free choice decisions, I could be a friend with God. Or we could write the same three letters as cherev, which means a sword. If I make incorrect free choice decisions, I am a in conflict with God. I can battle with God, in opposition with God. Right? Free choice, you can either choose to be a chaver, or you could choose to be a a cherif, like a sword, in opposition to God. That's, that's the power of free choice. Okay. Let's take a look at Shema Yisrael for a second. Twice a day we say these words, Shema Yisrael. Shema. Yisrael. Hashem. Elokeinu, Hashem, Echad. Okay. Shema Yisrael, Hashem, Elokeinu, Hashem, Echad. Let's analyze the state for one moment. First of all, Shema. Shema in Hebrew means listen. Listen, listen Israel, Shem Elkein, Shem God. What are we really saying? The word Shema, if you look at it, it actually contains shame, ayin. Shame in Hebrew means a name. It means Shemot means the essence of something. Shemayim is heaven, right? Sham means there. It's all the same thing. The essence of life is Sham, it's there, Shemayim, it's heaven. The word for joy in the is Simcha, which is the same Shin Mem, Simcha joy. When you get in touch with what's there, Sham, Shemayim, with the essence of life, you'll have joy. Shema means Essence, shame, ayin. What's ayin? Ayin is the eyes. eyes. What's the job of the eyes? See. To look, to see, to understand. Ayin, shame. Shema. Ayin, the essence. Look at the essence of the world. Shema. The job of the ears is to gather together all of the facts of this world and create some form of harmony in our head. You know, the eye looks and perceives something outside the body. The ear takes something inside. And when we speak, it's a very fascinating thing because you're taking my words and you're using your mind to construct and to formulate and analyze what I'm saying. 
Vision is a clear perspective of reality. I can see outside. Listening means I have to take what I see and bring it on the inside and form reality. That's why the word Vayishama actually means another root of Yishama means to gather together. Shal Shalomela, King Saul said, Vayishama et the Am. Gather the Am. It didn't say listen to the vision. Yishama means to gather. Sham, Shema, listen. Ayin, look out and perceive the essence of the world. Look and see. Look and perceive the essence. Look at the essence of the world. Think about the world a little bit. Shema. Shema, listen. Listen, not just listen. Perceive essence. Look at the world and discover what's going on in the world. Discover the essence of the world. Go to the zoo. Right? Go to the zoo. Go look at a giraffe. And ask yourself a simple question. A giraffe has a neck which is about four and a half, five feet. And the giraffe has a job that is to pump blood uphill. Uphill. Now, things like to go downhill. It's called gravity, right? How does that giraffe pump blood five feet uphill against gravity? Difficult job. So it so happens that the giraffe happens to have, guess what? A second pump. Where's that second pump? Right at the base of its neck. The heart pumps the blood all around the body, 33,000 miles. The giraffe is probably about 66,000 miles. Right? Goes around the body. It reaches the base of the neck. All of a sudden, the second pump kicks in and pumps the blood from the neck up to the brain. Which came first, the five-foot neck or the auxiliary pump? Well, let's think, right? If the five-foot neck was there without the auxiliary pump, you'd have giraffes which are brain dead. If the auxiliary pump is there without the five-foot neck, what's it doing there? Like when you see two things acting in, in harmony, in tandem, what do you say? You say designer. He happens to have a perfect pump right at the point of a five-foot neck to pump the blood from here to there. Beautiful. Go to the zoo and think about that. Think. God created the world in a way where if we'll look and think about the essence, we'll come and we will discover God in the world. And we'll have balance in life. That's what listening is. Listening is gathering all that information so that we should have the proper balance of how we're supposed to live our lives. Which is interesting, by the way, I'm going to come back just for a second. What's the word for ear in Hebrew? The word for ear is? Ozen. Now it's interesting. Ozen means ear. It also means, in Hebrew, izain means what? It means balance, a scale. A scale in Hebrew is called an izain. Just what happens, the word for ear means ear, ozen, and it means balance. Where is the physical point of balance in the human body? In the ear, right? When was that discovered scientifically? Moshe? Yeah, 1910, something? Yeah, 1920? Of course, we've had in the Hebrew language for the last 5,000 uh, and something years, right? 567 years, right? The force of physical balance is the ear. Where's the point of spiritual balance in the ear, in the body? Well, let's see. When you need spiritual balance, what do you do? Come to a Torah class. Come to a lecture. Right? The ear is the point of spiritual balance, which is very interesting, by the way, because Aleph means what? Aleph always means Hashem, something about Hashem. Zan in Hebrew means Zan at the Olam Kulo Bechvodo, to nourish the whole world. Hashem nourishes. Hashem provides spiritual balance, right? That's the job of the year. Hashem nourishes. Gathering the information about the world, which means thinking about it, is how we perceive God. Shema, listen, Israel. Not just listen. Gather up that information. Look into the essence of the world. Go to the zoo and think about that valve and pump at the base of the neck of a giraffe. Right? Or look at your own stomachs and notice that, right, any PAs here, right? Medical students? Yeah. We have a lot of hydrochloric acid in our stomachs. And that's why when we go to a wedding and we get served a samsa or something like that, or this, you know, this wedding last, I could do this wedding, by the way, you know, I was at this wedding, and first this, like, lamb came out. And it was so good. I had a big chunk of that. And I was like, oh, that was great, you know. I was full. And all of a sudden, they start bringing out samsas. Like, and so I have to take a samsa. I thought, that was great. I'm getting really stuffed. And, and then I go to dance. I come back to the table. 
they have this plate of, of onions with the um, this cube. Yeah, well, I gotta try it. So, oh, that was really good. You know, if I can't do this much longer, so I, I go to um, my wife's getting ready to leave. So I'm the only one that does this. But I go to the kitchen to get, to get tinfoil. You know, <laughs> you know so come back with the tinfoil there to start wrapping up some stuff. All of a sudden, they, they come with another platter of uh, of this. What was on the platter? I don't Chicken and meat. Chicken and meat. And, uh, and I was like, I was like, wow. This is. I mean, I was like, you know, I was in heaven. I was like, I was, I was like, I was. I was in heaven, I mean, but I, I couldn't, I wasted it all on that first piece of, of, uh, of lamb over there. I blew it. I should have been smarter. I should have been smarter. You know? I thought that was it. I thought that was the end. I thought it was great. A piece of lamb, go home. I should have known better. You see, you know, I'm always learning. But how did I get into that? Did, can anyone please trace me back for a second here? <laughs> let's, let's try. Moshe, give me. Oh, yeah, hydrochloric Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you very much. There we go. So, in any case, hydrochloric acid. So the way I was able to eat that piece of lamb is that we have hydrochloric acid in our stomachs. The question, hydrochloric acid is a very strong acid, as we know. Why doesn't it burn right through the walls of my stomach? The answer is, yeah, we have a coat of mucus that surrounds hydrochloric acid. That's it. The job of that mucus is to contain it and protect it. So the lamb, the samsa goes down, but it stays right where it's supposed to stay. And the hydrochloric acid doesn't burn through the wall of my stomach. Sometimes it does. It's called an ulcer. Right? Sometimes it does. That's an ulcer. Right? It creeps through. But in general, it doesn't. Which came first, my friends? <laughs> Which came first, the hydrochloric acid or the mucus? The mucus. Well, I mean, medical students will tell you, by the way, I asked my sister, he's a doctor. The whole purpose of the mucus, or his main function, is to contain the hydrochloric acid. So if the hydrochloric acid came without the mucus, right, no samsas. If the mucus came without the hydrochloric acid, there's no purpose of the mucus. So again, you see two things acting in perfect harmony. What do you say? Say designer. That's what it says. Listen, look at the world. Think about the world. Think of the essence of the world. Take it inside yourself. Shema. Bring it inside yourself and understand all these facts. Put it together. Right? Shema Yisrael. Shema, listen. Focus on the essence of what's happening. Wake up. Shema. Yisrael. Interesting. You know, in Hebrew, all words in Hebrew have three letter roots. When you see a one, two, three, four, five, a five-letter word, obviously you know it has to be contained of two words. That's a rule. Yisrael actually means, if you break up the letter word Yisrael, Yosha'el, which means, Yosha'el, which means God is straight. Yosha'el, God is straight. God, you are straight. I'm the one who's crooked. If I can't perceive you, God, in my life, it's not because you're not being straight. It's because I'm choosing not to see you. I'm crooked. I only have to focus a little bit to discover you, God. You are straight. But I can be crooked if I want to be. I can choose not to see. I can have my own drives, my own passion, my own wants. I don't want to see you, God, today. I want to do something else. But God is straight. Shema Yisrael. Shema. Gather up. Think deeply that God is straight. We're the ones that are crooked in our lives sometimes. Shema Yisrael. Hashem, God, you are yud He vav He. If you take those letters for God, yud He vav He, they actually express Haya Hova V'yihye. Haya means past, Hova means present, Yihye means future. God, you are past, present, future, all at the same time. You know, people always ask me the question, Rabbi, if God knows the future, how do I have free choice? Right? If God knows the future, I've heard this question... You know, someone said, like a seminar, Rabbi, I have to talk to you. I'm really bothered philosophically. So I go, guess what? Let me guess. Let me guess. If God knows the future, how do I have free choice? How'd you know that? How'd you know that? <laughs> you know, that's everyone's major question. The answer is a non-starter. Why is it a non-starter? God is past, present, future at the same time. yud hey vav hey Haya ho vav In the spiritual realm, there's no past, present, future. It merges into one. Time is a function of a physical reality. Time is something which is only relevant when you have a physical domain. Once you're out of the physical and the spiritual, you can have past, present, and future being the exact same thing. Can your minds comprehend that? No. 
I can't either. My piece of mush up here can't comprehend that. But that's God. God, the name of God, indicates that he's past, present, future all at the same time. So if God knows the future, there's no future. Just from our vantage point, there's a future. So don't get stuck by the question. It's not a question. You have to accept that the spiritual world doesn't operate this way. God doesn't operate the way we operate, and we just have to go with that. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Now let me show you this word Echad. Echad means what? It means one. When we say this, we put our eyes over, our hands over our eyes. Look at the word Echad. Echad, what do we say the Aleph represents? Spiritual, good. What do we say the Dalit represents? Physical world, beautiful. What did we say the Chet represented? That was a hey. The Chet was two swords battling each other. It was the battle of two opposites. That's how you read a Chet. When we're saying Hashem Echad, you know what we're saying? God, you are one. Meaning, I can discover you in every aspect of the physical world. There's nothing in the physical reality or in any reality which is not you. Hashem Echad. But oneness means, in order to perceive oneness, it means you've got to get that Aleph all the way out of the Dalit. But to get there, you have to pass through a Chet. And a Chet, as we know, is two opposites fighting. It's two fights. There's a fight. There's a fight. Because to perceive God in the world, in any aspect of the world, there's going to be a fight inside yourself. There's going to be a fight. There has to be a fight. God, if you're all about love and kindness, why do you bring that sickness? God, if you're all about mercy, why do you bring the Holocaust? Right? God, if you're all about... Yeah. Right? There are going to be questions in our lives. That's a chad. But if you're going to see God's oneness, oneness means is you have to bring that Aleph all the way out to the Dalit, but you have to first pass through the Chet. A chad. Oneness. And that's a fight. To see God's oneness in the world is a fight. There's going to be a battle inside your minds. God, I know you're all about love, but why is this happening to me? Isn't that interesting? That's what we're saying. Gather up all the information. Know that God is straight. He's past, present, and future, and there are no questions. And He's one. All of reality is Him. Take that Aleph. Oneness means see that Aleph out of the physical world. But to bring it out into the physical world, you're going to have to pass through that fight of the Chet. There's going to be a battle in your mind. God, I don't understand it all. Now guess what? When we say Shema Yisrael, by the way, what do we do? We cover our eyes. We cover our eyes. Why do we cover our eyes? Because God, to say that you're one is something that I can't always perceive. And therefore I cover my eyes to indicate I'm really in the darkness. And if I'm in the darkness, I'm going to have to use my heart to trust where my mind can't go. God, I don't see it. But I can't see everything in this world about you. I don't understand everything about you, God. I'm going to have to use my heart to trust what my mind can't see. In Hebrew, we call that emunah. What letter, by the way, represents trust? Oh, excuse me, what color represents trust? What color? White. White. Levan. Levan represents trust. If you'll notice, by the way, the root of the word white is lev, which is heart. And nun, when it's written like this, happens to be the longest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It extends really far. Levan. White represents trust. Why? Because what's trust? Trust is taking your heart as deep as it can go. Where my mind can no longer go. Right? Reason, where reason ends, faith begins, the Biskarov says. Where my mind can't perceive, I'm going to have to let my heart trust. God, I don't understand. I'm just going to have to trust. But you know, in any relationship, it's really what we don't know about the other which is the point of the real strength of the relationship. If you love somebody for what you know about that person, that's not loving the other, that's loving yourself. I'm loving my mind's definition of you. When you really love someone, you love what you don't know. I know enough about you 
to know that even what I don't know is something worth loving. That's real love. That's trust. White, for us, always symbolizes the idea of, of, of trust. When my mind can't go, my heart has to go. It's interesting, by the way, white, you know, there's seven colors in, a, in a, the spectrum, right? Red, orange, yellow, blue, green, indigo, and violet. However, when they all merge together, they're all white, right? White light, if you were to refract it, really contains seven other colors. So it's interesting. White light contains something beneath it, but you can't see it. White always indicates there's something more that my eye can't penetrate, which is the idea of trust. I can't perceive it, but it's there. What's the color that represents for us belief in God through using the mind and the intellect? Blue. Blue. Chachol. Chachol. If you break that letter down, that, that word down, it's koach of Lamed. The koach of Lamed. What does koach mean in Hebrew? The strength of Lamed. The letter Lamed in Hebrew means Lamed means Limed, study. The strength of study. Blue always represents the idea of using the mind and studying God's ways. Using the intellect to go as far as you can go. And in fact, the color that the eye can see before the eye can no longer detect colors is what color? It happens to be blue. That's when, when you look at anything from a distance, what color do things appear? When you look at the ocean from a distance, what color is it? Blue. When you get close up, hey, this isn't blue. Right? You look at the sky from a distance, what color is it? Blue. When you go up in an airplane, you go, hey, this isn't blue. What's going on? Seeing out towards something, the eye can perceive only up to blue. Blue always indicates the koach of Lamed. Lamed limed, the koach of study. Now, it's interesting. We have a mitzvah in the Torah to have to wear tzitzit. Tzitzit are composed of eight strings, right? You have a four-cornered garment, and on the corner you have to put eight strings. That's four strings blowed all over. And then there's a mitzvah from the Torah to take one blue string and to thread it around. The tzitzit symbolized to us the base of life has to be the white. The base of life has to be trust. Because you're never going to perceive everything about God. You're never going to discover it. You're going to have to trust. And a real relationship is only built through trust. But once you have that basis, an understanding, I'm not going to see it all. Okay. Then take your blue. Take your koach of intellect. Take your mind and go as deep as you can go. Use your mind. Use that powerful machine we have here called the brain. Try to study. Try to understand. But always understand there's always going to be something you will never get to. And that's why when we look at the Aleph and we spell it backwards, Aleph means God. You spell it the other way, it means Pella. Pella means wonder. Because there's always going to be something about God which is going to be a wonder. You're never going to get there fully with intellect. And that's why when we say Shema Yisrael, we cover our eyes. God, I know it's all you. I know everything is you. There's nothing in this world that was just a manifestation of your oneness. It's all you. And I'm going to declare it. Echad. I'm going to fight to see it. I'm going to bring that Allah out to the Dalit. I'm going to have to pass it through that Chet. There's going to be a battle. And that's when you say Echad. You say Echad. Because you're thinking. I want to bring that Aleph all the way out to the Dalit. But my eyes have to be covered. Why? Because ultimately I'm not going to be able to perceive it all. And where the mind can't go to, I'm going to have to let the heart trust. And that's what it symbolizes. Okay, everybody, another little taste of the Hebrew language. Thank you very much for listening.